Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, we're going to be talking about osmoregulation. Uh, before we get into osmoregulation, we should define what osmosis is. Remember, that is diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. So let's say right here we have this U-tube, and on this side we have a high molarity of water, so a lot of sugar on this side, on this side we don't have as much. And so basically the sugar would love to spread out, but it can't because the sugar can't fit through the semi-permeable membrane, but the water can. So the water is going to flow from an area of high water concentration to low water concentration. And so basically if you were to watch this, you couldn't see the sugar, but the, the water on this side would mysteriously raise and lower on this side. And it would require no energy. If you were to do the opposite of that, so if you were to do reverse osmosis, we'd have to squeeze it in this direction and we could get pure water. And that's how you actually purify water. If you look on your water bottle, it'll say reverse osmosis a lot of the time. So how does this impact cells? Because in plant cells, it's okay for there to be movement of water because they have a cell well, but for us, not so much. And so basically, if you were to take a red blood cell and have it sit in an isotonic environment, in other words, an environment where the concentration in the blood and outside the blood is the same, you're going to get a movement of water, but the, the blood cells are going to be happy like they're pictured right here. If you put them in a hypertonic area, so if you put them in sugary water, then water is going to flow out. And you can see that the red blood cells are going to shrivel up. Likewise, if you were to put them in distilled water, water is going to flow in and they're going to pop or they're going to lice. And so it's really important to the cells in our body that they remain isotonic. So what are the two life strategies? Well, the two life strategies are some organisms have just decided this is too much effort. And so what they are called is osmoconformers. And so an osmoconformer like this octopus right here, the osmolarity, and so osmolarity, remember, is going to be the concentration of solutes to water, is going to be the same on the outside as it is on the inside. In other words, they're just going to be the same osmolarity as their surroundings. It's nice because they don't have to regulate that. The bad thing is that you're going to get big swings that can affect the rest of the organism. So a lot of organisms are what are called osmoregulators. Great example of this would be the brine shrimp that are found in salt water. Uh, brine shrimp and we would have some like in the Great Salt Lake. Basically, what they do is they have to regulate the amount of water inside them. So they live in a salt water environment. So think about where the water is going to flow. Is it going to want to flow into them or out of them? That's right. It's going to flow out of them. So they're going to water's constantly going to be lost. So they're going to have to do a lot of effort. In fact, 30% of their metabolism just goes to regulating this balance of uh, osmolarity. If we think about fish or fish that live in a freshwater environment versus a saltwater environment, if you really understand osmosis, this is easy to think about. If you're a fish living in a freshwater environment, where is the saltier area that's going to be inside the fish? And so basically, they're going to keep having water flow into them. And so they don't drink water. That's the blue here. Basically, they eat food, but they have urine that is really, really dilute. Um, and that's just because they're going to have a net influx of water due to osmosis. If you move to a saltwater fish, so in a saltwater fish, we're going to have the opposite problem now. Now the salt water is going to be have a higher solute concentration, and so we're going to have water that's going to keep flowing out of them. And so they have to actually drink salt water, and their urine is going to be really, really concentrated. Okay, so we're not fish, we're not brine shrimp, we live on land. And so how do we osmoregulate? Well, we osmoregulate using this organ right here. It's called the kidney. And so this is the kidney. It's going to empty urine into the bladder, and then we finally get rid of that. But we use that on land to regulate our osmolarity. And living on land, it's almost more important that we're able to do that. Now, this gets a little complex, but if you can hold with me, I think you'll understand how this works. So basically... Let me go back for just a second. If this is the kidney right here, on the inside of the kidney, over and over and over again, we're going to have this, which is called the nephron. So the nephron repeated over and over and over essentially makes um, a kidney. And so basically what happens is blood is going to flow in. Blood is going to flow into something called the glomerulus. And then it's going to into, flow into this, which is called the Bowman's capsule. The Bowman's capsule is going to do uh, one thing. It's going to filter the blood. We also have proximal and distal tubule. That's important for secretion and reabsorption. But we're not going to talk about any of that right now. Again, what we're focusing on is the water. Okay, so basically what happens is the blood flows in and a lot of the water and the solutes are going to squirt out and they're going to move into this 
filtrate. This is eventually going to become urine. So again, this is eventually going to go over here, going to go end up in your bladder. So basically what's happening down here, well, as it enters into the adrenal, or excuse me, the renal medulla, basically what's going to happen is water is going to flow out. And water is going to flow out and as water starts to flow out, the osmolarity inside this descending tubule is going to increase. And so the concentration at the beginning is around 300 milliosmoles, but it's going to increase to the point down here where it's around 1,200. So we're going to set up a gradient. And so on this side, water is going to flow out, water is going to flow out, water is going to flow out. Now it's not just flowing out into the interstitial fluid. A lot of that water is be, being reclaimed because we're going to have capillaries outside here as well. And so on this descending side of the loop of Henle, that's what this this is called, basically what's going to happen is it's going to release water. And so we're going to set up a gradient. Now on the ascending side, on the other side, we're, this is on the right side of it, it's not going to be permeable to water. But it is going to be permeable to salt. And so basically what's going to happen on this side is we're going to lose salt. And we're going to lose salt, and we're going to lose salt. And as we get into this thick portion of the loop of Henle, we're actually pumping that salt out. And so basically now what we have is a gradient, where down here it's 1,200 milliosmoles, but then we have it going all the way back up, so it's 300 milliosmoles up here. And so basically it goes horizontal all the way across here. So what's the work of all the loop of Henle for? All of the work is to set up this gradient. And, and this is called a countercurrent exchange. So it's important that the fluid is following in opposite directions. So these are interacting with each other. So basically we've set up a gradient where on this side it's, it's not as concentrated as we move down here. It's really, really concentrated at the bottom. And so let me remove all of that. So again, we're going to have 300 up here. We're going to have 1,200 up down here. And so basically there's a gradient that goes across like this. Okay, so what is this? This is called the collecting duct. And so basically now we have control over that water. And so again, this is the filtrate. It's eventually going to become urine. But basically we can control whether or not we let water out. And we do that using a hormone, and that hormone is called antidiuretic hormone. Think about the name. It's antidiuretic Diuretic is anything that, just think about diarrhea, it's releasing water. So an antidiuretic is something that has us hold on to water. So basically we have this gradient right here, and if we release antidiuretic hormone, which is going to come from the posterior pituitary, it's going to interact on this collecting duct over here. When it interacts with this collecting duct, it basically says you can let water through. And so if you can let water through, water is going to flow out of here and it's going to flow back into our capillaries and into our interstitial fluid. And so basically if we secrete a lot of ADH, basically this gradient is going to allow us to reclaim water and more water and more water and more water and more water. And even though we've gotten almost all of the water out of our urine, it's really concentrated out here. So osmosis is going to pull that water out of it. Likewise, let's say we drank a bunch of water and we don't need to reclaim that, then we're going to decrease the amount of ADH. And basically now we can't let water out through here and so that water instead is just going to flow out into our urine. And so when you look at your urine and look at the different color in it, what's responsible for that? Well basically it's the amount of ADH that we're releasing, but more importantly it's this wonderful gradient that was set up in the loop of Henle. And so that's osmolarity. Again, we're osmoregulators and you can thank our kidneys and our nephron for that. And I hope that's helpful.